In an earlier video, we introduced the rock type peridotite, which is this material here inside of the xenolith. Well, what if we took that peridotite and did some experiments where we try to melt it at a range of pressures? So we'll have pressure increasing to the right, and we'll start with experiments that are at one atmosphere. So we'll have a little capsule, and we'll fill it up with some peridotite, and we'll just put the thing on a furnace, let it heat up until it melts. Well, it's not going to melt at a single temperature. Let's let temperature be increasing on the vertical axis. It would begin melting at about 1100 degrees centigrade, and it might finish melting at about 1800 degrees centigrade. So below 1100, it would be solid. Above 1800, it would be liquid, and in between, it would be a mixture of solid plus liquid. But if we increase the temperature to, let's say, I don't know, let's say 20 kilobars, doesn't matter what we choose, we would have a higher temperature. The temperatures would increase. That pressure would effectively hold that crystalline material together and, and require more energy, and, and so a higher temperature to melt. And we could do a number of experiments at higher and higher pressures, and so we would get a curve with a positive slope with higher melting temperatures as we go to higher and higher pressures. We shouldn't have these bumps in it. It would really be a monotonic curve. Everything below this bottom curve would be solid. Everything above this upper curve would be liquid and everything in between would be a mixture of solid plus liquid. So at this pressure here, for example, if we just take this pressure, at this temperature it's solid, at this temperature it's a mixture of solid plus liquid, but by the time we get here it's entirely melted, so that we have this melting interval. Because of this arrangement, we can give these curves a term. We can call this guy the solidus, so everything below the temperature of the solidus is solid, and we can call this guy the liquidus. And so everything above the liquidus is liquidus is liquid, and everything in between will be some mixture. So we do these kinds of experiments to figure out how, mantle, uh, how the mantle will melt. Now let's take a look and compare it to our geotherm. So we've had this diagram in the past where we compare temperature to pressure or depth uh, increasing downwards. This is temperature increasing to the right. We have a lithosphere that is cold and rigid and heat uh, is conveyed by conduction. And then we have a convective mantle where the geotherm is very steep. So how do the solidus and liquidus compare? Well, let's draw these in. For today's Earth, uh, well, uh, the solidus might be, let's say, here, and we'll draw it in there, and then maybe the liquidus is way out here, uh, and uh, let's say if we're talking about Fresno, California, uh, there is no, there are no volcanoes because there is nowhere where the geotherm uh, temperature exceeds the solidus. But what if we were to strip away the lithosphere? So let's uh, let's think about the case where we have a lithosphere. So this is the lithosphere here. What if we were to take the lithosphere and make it thinner? What if we were to make the lithosphere instead of this thickness? What if we were to make it this thickness? Well, that means this convective mantle could rise upward, and it might reach the point where it would intersect that red curve. Remember, this is the solidus here, that's the liquidus, and we would get a little bit of partial melting. Let's uh, clear the chalkboard and take another look at this. So let's say we have the same situation that we've drawn before, but we're going to magnify that area. So we will have a geotherm. Let's have the geotherm look like this. It'll be very steep down here. And then we'll have a lithosphere that starts out here. So that's our boundary. We have these, this, this very um, steep curve here, very uh, sharp increase in temperature in the conductive uh, lithosphere. And then below here, we have the convective mantle where we have a, uh, well, essentially a, a much shallower, the way we've drawn it, it looks like a steep curve, but it's a very shallow increase in temperature. We don't get a huge change in temperature. Uh, but if the solidus is sitting at some set of temperatures here, so let's say 
this is the solidus that we'll put in red, if we allow the lithosphere to be decreased in thickness, so the lithosphere starts out at this thickness, but if we allow it to thin to some more shallow depth, then we can allow this convective geotherm to rise to a much shallower depth. So this is our initial lithosphere thickness, we'll call it L0, and then we can have over here a lithosphere thickness L1. So LO is much greater than L1, so we have this thinner lithosphere, and now the geotherm is able to rise to temperatures that are above the solidus. You can see that for our purposes, for the modern Earth, the liquidus doesn't really matter. Maybe in the early Earth, uh, the geotherm was hot enough that the liquidus way out here would have some kind of effect. But for us, it does not, not in the modern Earth. We don't come anywhere close to the liquidus. We just have small degrees of partial melting. If you think of the solidus and liquidus um, as being contoured as we go from 0% melting to 100% melting. You could put in some contours here, and the most melting that we would ever get would probably be in the 10 to 15% range, maybe as high as 20, 20 or 25% in the hottest parts of the mantle, but we don't come anywhere close to the 100% melt, melting that we would expect if we get to temperatures that are uh, at or above the liquidus.